10 all these representatives on that council who were to be elected. And there were, in fact, elections held in July of 1939 for the Council of Government. Now, that electoral campaign was marked, was a very bitter one, because the, uh, the Constitutional Party, at the time there was a Constitutional Party led by George Strickland, who was already Prime Minister for some time, and who incidentally was the founder of the newspaper I worked for. And, well, the Constitutional Party attacked its main uh, opposition, the, its main rivals, the Nationalist Party, who were accusing it of pro-Italian bias. And pro-Italian bias um, at the time meant sympathy for fascist Italy. But they must underline the fact that the uh, Nationalist Party always upheld the sort of traditional Italian influence in Malta long before fascism made its appearance in Italy. But obviously the distinction between fascism and pro-Italianism was very blurred uh, at the, on the eve of the war, especially as uh, the Italian dictator Mussolini had thrown in his lot with Adolf Hitler, uh, as we know. <coughs> well, that election was won by the Constitutional Party. Uh, they, they managed to elect six out of ten. Uh, three members were elected by the Nationalist Party, and one member was elected for the Labour Party. Uh, the three Nationalist MPs were not MPs, they were members only of the Council of Government. There were the two co-leaders of the party, Dr. Enrico Mitzi and Sarah Gouvenshoud, and uh, a very young Dr. George Porsche de Vier, who went on to become the father of Walter's independence. Anyway, so, as, as we said, this, this, this electoral campaign was dominated by the pro-Italian and anti-British, or pro-British and anti-Italian uh, attacks. And, uh, Eventually, uh, in September, very shortly afterwards, Germany declared war, as we know. Germany invaded Poland, and Britain and France, which had given guarantees to Poland against uh, their integrity, you know, against the tax on their integrity, uh, declared war on Germany. Um, and though Italy and Germany were very close allies, Italy remained neutral. So Malta, for the time being, was spared from the war. You know, Malta was not touched by the war because Italy had remained neutral. However, in May of the following year, in May 1940, uh, after the so-called phony war ended, uh, Germany invaded, or rather in April, Germany invaded Norway, and in May they invaded Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, and France. And that same month, Enrico Mitzi, one of the leaders of the Nationalist Party, uh, and 43 others, 43 other deputies were interned uh, here in Malta, in a place called Fort San Salvatore, uh, for their pro-Italian sympathies. They were not formally charged, but they were rounded up and in turn. In June, just a month later, <coughs> uh, Germany was sweeping through France and uh, Mussolini, uh, who didn't plan to enter the war for at least another two years, well, he, he saw that Germany was about to win the war. And he reasoned that, you know, Germany would be dictating the peace and he would be left out of it and there would be nothing for him. So, on the 10th of June, Mussolini called a big gathering in Rome, in Piazza Venezia, where he declared war on Britain and France. Incidentally, among the various placards shown in the crowd, the crowd hoisted placards, uh, was the name, was the word Malta. Malta was one of the territories which Mussolini, fascist Italy, claimed as 
Terra Redenta, which means unredeemed land, along with other places like Corsica, which was belonged to France, Nice, which also belonged to France, Tunis, etc. So, uh, obviously, Mussolini had his eyes on Malta. In fact, the very next day, June the 11th, Italian bombers raided Malta for the first time, dropping bombs uh, and killing soldiers and civilians, uh, for instance, in Fort St. Elmo and in Vietnam, people were already killed. Unfortunately, Malta was very unprepared for the war. The, the, the British uh, strategy did not consider Malta important enough, apparently. They didn't take the Italian jet very seriously. So, Malta had no defenses at all, practically. Only three aircraft, three biplanes um, were available, three cluster gladiators, uh, which the Maltese dubbed Fate, Hope and Charity of which only fate survived. You can see fate at the War Museum in Fort St. Elmo. So, Italians started to bombard Malta. Uh, not very effectively, because uh, you know, people who witnessed these air raids would say that they would go very high up and drop their bombs, you know, and scatter away. But the situation didn't last very long, unfortunately, because in January 1941, the Germans sent the dive bombers to Malta to attack uh, um, an aircraft carrier, HMS Illustrious, uh, which they claimed to have sunk several times, but which eventually made its way to Malta. And the German dive bombers, of course, spread terror among the Maltese population because they used to zoom low and drop the load and make off. Uh, they didn't manage to sink um, HMS Illustrious, the aircraft carrier, uh, although they damaged it. But in the meantime, they practically destroyed, raised to the ground, the three cities. The three cities which you can admire from the Baraka Gardens, the three cities overlooking the harbour. Uh, and uh, uh, they were practically reduced to rubble. Now, just before this, this attack, the Maltese had already started to seek shelter inland. So, those who could afford it, or those who had relatives in fairly quiet places like the Fricara, Lia, the three villages, Gozo, uh, a lot of Maltese came over to Gozo because they imagined Gozo was much safer than Malta because it had no military targets. Anyway, so you, you had this emigration from the three cities and from Valletta. Incidentally, Valletta at the time, <coughs> most of Malta's population was concentrated around the harbour area. <coughs> Valletta alone had about 30,000 inhabitants. Uh, whereas today you have only 6,000. And uh, this is because obviously the lack of transport, you know, cars were not so frequent, etc. And the total population in Malta at the time was about 260,000. So a good proportion of those that population lived in the three harbour, in the harbour area. So, um, Eventually, the uh, war intensified because the Germans were speeding up their attacks. And in 1942, in February of 1942, the Enrico and the 43 others who were interned uh, were exiled from Malta because, my theory is, they were afraid, of course, the, the prospects of a German invasion were quite real. And my, my theory is that they would have used those people to run a puppet administration. This is my theory. So, I mean, this, is, this would have been the reasoning behind what the British did by exiling all these people, all these uh, nationals. 
Although, I must say, the courts in Malta had, had declared that this action was illegal and that the governor had acted ultra vires beyond his powers. And uh, while this was going on, Sir Hugo Mifsud, the other co-leader of the Hens Party, in the Council of Government, uh, made a, an, an impassioned plea uh, in defence of these uh, 44 people. And uh, he was taken ill at the end, and in fact died three days later. Uh, now I'm going ahead slightly, I'll return to the narrative uh, later. Eventually those uh, exiles went to Uganda, they, they went through a, a very difficult voyage till they reached Egypt, you know, the, the, their, uh, their ship was attacked, etc. And they were moved to, to Uganda. The, the exiles included, besides uh, the convincing, included the Chief Justice at the time, Sir Arthur Omechia, who was also possible, by the way and other prominent people, and also lesser known people, doctor workers, for instance. Uh, and the, uh, the exiles returned to Malta only in March of 1945, when the war was practically ended. But paradoxically, paradoxically, the Constitutional Party, led by Lord Strickland, Lord Strickland, by the way, died in 1940, in August of 1940, uh, the Constitutional Party was dissolved a year after the uh, exiles returned from Uganda. Very ironic. Now to go back to the narrative of 1941. Uh, in the St. Lucia Street, Valletta, there was a hotel called the St. James Hotel. It used to be known as the Imperial Hotel where Garibaldi, when he came to Malta in 1864, <laughs> stayed for three days. Now, this uh, hotel was taken over in 1917 by a certain Rafael Gabaretta. Rafael Gabaretta used to run the same hotel in St. Paul's Street, which is still existing today. It was known as Savior House. Uh, belong to the Jesuits, I think it's been disposed of already, or now recently. And he moved to the, uh, to the uh, Imperial Hotel and renamed it St. James Hotel. The St. James Hotel was easily the biggest hotel in Valletta. Its, uh, its clients were mostly service, senior service people, uh, traveling businessmen. Tourism was very, wasn't very um, significant in those days. In fact, um, their high season used to be the winter rather than the summer. But it was a pleasant hotel, it, was, um, it had all the modern conveniences of the time. And uh, in uh, March of 1941, incidentally, Rafa Gabaretta was married to a certain Teresa Borch, whose mother owned the Cecil Hotel another hotel in Valletta, in Old Bakery Street, which later became known as Mayfair House, the headquarters of the General Workers Union. Uh, and her brother ran another hotel called the Westminster Hotel in Kingsway, uh, you know, Republic Street today. It was known as Kingsway, and the Westminster Hotel actually belonged to Lord Strickland. It was incidentally disposed of uh, a couple of years ago uh, by the heirs of Rothschild, which was the company, the Tango Water, where I work for. Where I work for. So the Gabaretta, Rafa Gabaretta and Teresa Borch between them had ten children, seven daughters and three sons. Now, as the German dive bombing attacks intensified, Valletta increasingly became, came under fire. And in March 1941, a parachute mine hit the St. James Hotel, destroying it completely, and also the nearby Auberge d'Auvergne, one of the auberges of the Knights, which was used as the law courts. The law courts were housed in this Auberge d'Auvergne, 
and the local tour rebuilt in the 60s. Uh, you can see the now in a Gothic style building, but it was before the Auberge de Verne. And the Auberge de Verne and the St. James Hotel were destroyed by these paraguay mines. Uh, fortunately, none of the Gabaretta family uh, were injured. They have been or killed. They were. They found refuge in the underground shelter. Incidentally, the, the the loss of life in Malta was relatively low uh, among civilians when you consider that there were over 3,300 air raids in the course of the war, with Malta being the most bombed place on earth for a time during the war. So it's a, it's a miracle that only 1,500 people actually died. Uh, civilians died in the war. But this hotel was destroyed. A lot of the items were stolen because unfortunately we had people scavenging through the remains of the, uh, destroyed houses and taking away what they could find. And uh, so they were homeless. And what they did then, they had a summer residence, the Gabaretta family had a summer residence in Incita. Believe it or not, because very, not very far away, but it was their summer residence. But at Encina, there was a military target. There was uh, a torpedo depot, uh, which uh, was closed only about 50 years ago, just <coughs> after mortars and destroyers. And this torpedo depot obviously was a military target, and it came in for its share of bombing. And exactly a year. Exactly after the hotel was destroyed, the Msita, the summer residence of the Gabaretta family, was destroyed too. So they, they had to seek uh, lodgings elsewhere. They actually went to move in with some of the tenants. They had some property and they asked the tenants, please let us in because we have nowhere else to stay. So, um, as I said, the, this migration from the harbour area, incidentally, among those who migrated from the harbour area, was a statue of the Immaculate Conception, venerated in Cospicua, one of the three cities. It was taken for safekeeping in Bepicara, the Legion Church of Bepicara, where it stayed throughout the war and it was returned with great pomp and ceremony after the end of the war. <coughs> uh, so, among the areas hosting, as I said, hosting refugees from what time was the tranquil sister island of Goto. However, Goto too was not spared. Now we concentrate on Goto. The village of Einsiedel in particular. Well, in Einsiedel, <coughs> there was a certain Lorenzo Grek, hailing from a family of fishermen. They were 11 children in all. And uh, Lorenzo Grek was headmaster at the government school, at the government primary school in Hamley Street. Uh, he was affectionately known as Sir Mastro, you know, the headmaster. And he and his wife Carmela, a Jews, and their children, except their eldest son Paul, who had already joined the police force and was serving in Malta, lived practically next door to the school. Early in the morning of January 29th, 1942, while Lorenzo was hearing Mass in the parish church of Einstein and the old parish church, a lone Italian bomber, an Italian bomber left its, uh, you know, the other, uh, the other squadron, left on its own, and moved on to Gozo and dropped a string of bombs from the St. Joseph home right up to Hamley Street. Two bombs hit the Greek family household and killed Carmela, the wife, who was 49 and four of her children. Emilia, who was 17, Ines, who was 16, John, who was 11, 
and, and Lina and Angela and Lina six. Three other children, Rita, Teresa and Joseph, were buried underneath the rubble, but were pulled out. <coughs> Rita, however, was seriously injured and had to spend six weeks in hospital to recover from her injuries. Another son, Carmelo, uh, luckily was not sleeping at his parents' home, but he was sleeping uh, in the home of an old priest who was uh, keeping him company. Lorenzo Greg, on coming back from Mass, from church, was utterly shattered when he returned home and found that his wife and four of his children, half his family, had been wiped out. <clears throat> he was inconsolable and it took years for him to recover. Though when the anniversary came around every year, he would still feel depressed. Uh, there was a lot of uh, solidarity shown to Lorenzo Greg from various quarters, including, I must say, from the father of Dr. Tabone, Dr. Anton Tabone, the father of Mr. Tabone here, yeah, who was head of the Catholic Action at the time. And uh, they raised some money for him. Uh, and also, uh, a lot of parishioners uh, contributed, etc. But it was no consolation, of course, because he had lost his family practically. Uh, he, of course, couldn't bear staying in Amsterdam at the time. Um, they, when the funeral from that's from Rabat, the corpses of the his five members of the Greg family, uh, practically the whole village of Einsiedel took part in the funeral. It was a very moving experience. So Lorenzo could not stay in Einsiedel, and he asked to be transferred to Ala, the school in Ala, to the school in Ala, where he stayed with the rest of his family for a year. His daughter Rita, meanwhile, had recovered from her injuries, had received an app her appointment as a primary school teacher, but she was asked to serve in Isaiah. A year later, this we're talking about 1943 now, a year later Lorenzo, Rita and the rest of the family moved to Valletta in St. Nicholas Street. They had a, a, an apartment there. Because in Valletta he was given the appointment of assistant headmaster at one of the major schools of the government at the time. The Auberge de Bavier was a school, uh, run, uh, you know, a major school, uh, one of the most important ones, and was given the post of assistant headmaster at the Auberge de Bavier. While Rita was transferred to the government school in Albin Street. Uh, now, one of Rita's female colleagues in Old Main Street was none other than Vincenza Gavarretta, the daughter of the hotel manager, of the hotel owner, the second daughter of Rachel Gavarretta, who, unlike her sisters and unlike her, unlike her sisters, had decided not to marry, to look after her parents. Her mother passed away in 1938, before the war, and uh, her father, after he lost his hotel, was devastated, and he, she decided to look after him. And three of her, three of her brothers were still around; they had not married yet, and they were living in Msida. Uh, so, Rita would often invite her colleague, Vincenzo Gavarretta, to the home in uh, St. Nicholas Street, where she got to know, obviously, she got to know Rita's father, Lorenzo, who soon became attracted to her. Uh, as I said, in February 1945, Rita Gavarretta passed away. Vincenzo was left to care for her siblings, three or four were married, by 1946, they were married. It was then that Lorenzo proposed to Vincenzo Gavarretta. 
she too had grown fond of him, but it took her some time to convince herself it was the right move because there was an age difference of 17 years between them. Um, and, you know, she was having second thoughts about telling him someone so, so much older than her. In the meantime, Rita, Rita Gregg, married, in 1946, married Charles Cremona, and they went to live in Zira. And Lorenzo and his youngest son, Joseph, moved in with them. Lorenzo Gregg and Vincenzo Gavaretta were eventually married on the 2nd of June, 3rd of June, 1947, at the Zira Parish Church. He was 58, and she was 41. They went to live in the Imsida home, which had been rented by Rachel Gavaretta. Vincenza had been a teacher for 25 years, but at the time uh, she had to resign on marriage. When Lorenzo, in the meantime, had been transferred to Imsida Primary School, uh, resigned two years later on reaching retirement age. On March the 11th, 1948, the marriage was blessed with the birth of a son, whom the proud father named after him, Lawrence, namely your brother speaker. <laughs> Four years later, on September 14, 1952, when Vincenza was 46 and Lawrence, Lorenzo, 63, a daughter, Grace, was born. In May 1954, during the visit of Queen Elizabeth to Malta, she was on her Commonwealth tour after being crowned uh, Queen. Uh, it was a very long Commonwealth tour. Lorenzo was invited to attend the unveiling of the Christ the King monument, which is very near here. Uh, it's the monument to the gods that were awarded here in Victoria. The names of Carmela and her four children can be seen on the monument. Incidentally, Carmela Jus was the sister of Monsignor George Jus, a great benefactor of St. George's Basilica, whose bust can be seen on entering the church. Some 20 years later, a monument to the Einstein Award, also including the names of the Greg family, was inaugurated near the new Einstein Parish Church. My father died on July 20th, 1969, the day man first landed on the moon. He was 80. My mother died on April 15, 1985, my father's birthday, incidentally, at the age of 78. She had lived to see both her children get married, my wife is here, Lillian, and five of her grandchildren. Thank you very much. Any questions on the floor? Uh, for those interested, I, may, I have a copy here of um, a, a, a parish magazine called Anxiety with the story of the tragedy in Hamry Street recounted you know, with the pictures of the various uh, people involved. If you would like to see them. But, uh, uh -huh. Andrew. Sorry, I'll stand because I thought you were going to take a Hi. Just out of curiosity, uh -huh. I mean, your father displayed something of the perverse nature that I've seen in your own work, when you're a mm -hmm. journalist. Everybody said he out of Valletta. Uh -huh. I mean, he heads into Valletta. After the war. Was well, after the war. The was, 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 was over, I think. No, no. He, he came to Valletta practically when the war was ended, you know, because he was first moved to Ala. And then a year later, he moved to Valletta because, in the meantime, his daughter had been given an appointment at the government school in. But this was 1943 44. So just about over? No, just about over, yes. I mean, the last area in Malta was in July of 1943. So we're there. Okay. Once there doesn't seem to be any. <coughs> 
I'll ask you a, when I ask you a question. You, you uh, while you were giving the background to your personal, very personal story, how interspersed was it with uh, the events taking place in these islands and in the continent, you mentioned that uh, when Italy declared war, Malta was very, very, very unprepared. Uh, now that is not contested by anyone. However, once I read a book by an Italian historian, he, he died. Right, yeah. No, he died a year ago or two, a very famous Italian historian, Arrigo Petacco. Mm -hmm. And he gave a, diff a very different take on this. He said that actually the English were preparing to surrender Malta. And they had a, an actual fact already sent all the biplanes, the, 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 uh, they, they were already created to the central Alexandria, and only when Mussolini did not unleash the war, the invasion of Malta, which everybody expected him to do on the war of 10 June 1940. And in the meanwhile, there was a change in Prime Minister in London. Churchill was an able man that he appreciated more then Chamberlain, the importance of Malta, and it was only then that the English changed their mind and decided to defend Malta. How credible do you think is this account given by Rico Petacco that actually the British were prepared to surrender Malta? And in actual fact, it seems that also Churchill was, was prepared to give Malta away um, as a way to, to to, to allow, to, to, to let Italy not enter the war on the I, I can't exclude this possibility at all, but what I know for sure is that in 1942, the situation in Malta was so precarious, and food supplies were running out, fuel was absolutely lacking, and it was thanks to the miraculous arrival of this Santa Maria convoy, we call it the Santa Maria convoy in August 1942, which saved us from surrender because I read somewhere that there was actually the date of September the 1st of 1942 for Malta to surrender. Uh, we were very close to uh, surrendering, you know, uh, and it was the convoy that saved us basically because, uh, I mean, it was the height of the siege of Malta in August 1942 was the height and that convoy saved us. But uh, this is it, I mean, we were very close to surrender. But this was but, before, yeah. this but, was but before. But we were talking about it before, no. That we were underwent because apparently the, the British thought that the Italians were not a, a serious threat to what in fact, at the time. Because as I said, Mussolini did not plan to enter the war until 1942. All his advisors were telling us we are prepared to go to war for, for at least two years. He himself was telling Hitler. We're not prepared to go to war yet, but he was overtaken by, you know, the enthusiasm caused by the German success in France, and he imagined that the war would be over very soon, and he would, he would remain, he would remain with nothing because he wouldn't be present at the peace conference. George, first of all, Mr. Nick, congratulations on your good of ancestry. Congratulations. <laughs> I would like to, to, uh, to mention as well, uh, another family ha that had Gosdana's ancestry, Dimitri's family, Fortunato and Enrico. You mentioned Enrico. What was the difference in, in the attitude, not policy I would say, attitude of uh, Enrico Mitzi to the attitude of his father, Fortunato Mitzi, with regard to the Italians? Well, they... <laughs> Sister Davon is more suited to give an explanation of this, but as far as I know, you know, there was a genuine um, concern that Malta's heritage, which was for, for long years influenced by Italy, uh, one has to remember that the Knights of Malta were holding Malta as a, as a fiefdom, as a, you know, they, they were ultimately answerable to the King of Naples because the original donation of Malta to Knights came from the Emperor Charles V, who was also King of Spain. And Spain occupied the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, and so 
you know, the more they recovered about it, the Knights, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies in 1798, when the Knights left. But the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies were in no position to defend Malta or to take it over. So the Maltese called the British to help them against the French, and the British were not care. But the fact is that there was so much Italian influence here, the culture was so Italian. Italian was an official language, um, you know, that um, Fortunato Vizzi and uh, the others were uh, very jealous of this tradition and they didn't want it to, uh, to you know, to disappear. They, they wanted to retain this Italian culture and this is why I underline the fact that the pro-Italian sympathies preceded the, the rise of fascism in Italy. Uh, because sometimes one makes the mistake that they were fascists, but they were not fascists, they were pro Italians because they believed in the Italian language and culture. So, so, so Walter, sometimes there were some who were pro Italian. There were some who were pro And there were some who also had pro fascist sympathies. Um, uh, I wonder whether there are any other people, yes? No, we can't do this. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. It's half positive. I was, yeah. half positive. I was going to ask whether there are uh, any relatives of your father still living on the island. Yes, there are nephews and nieces. All his brothers and sisters passed away. Uh -huh. The last one to pass away was aged 98. She lived in Njaro. Uh -huh. uh, you might know her, uh, Rosa Schwer. Uh -huh. uh, on, on, on the left as you go up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but there are various uh, cousins and nephews and nieces uh, in Malta, Australia and America. I see. But on his wife's side. <coughs> his on his wife's side. I don't yeah. know much about those. Don't know much. I know that Don George Ajux was her Ajux. brother. Uh -huh. And she was Ajux. Her surname was Ajux. Her surname was Ajux, yes. Her mm -hmm. yes. surname was Ajux. Yeah, Don George, right? Don George. Don George. Yes, he had a nephew in, uh, he had a nephew for sure in, uh, in America. Uh, but I don't know much about the atmosphere. Andrew. Yep. We know how come you're here. Since then, when did you join the Times? When did you, when did you join, join the Times? The times? And and how did you join the Times? How did you join the Times? Let me tell you how I joined the Times. Yeah, because I'm going to. It's all a family affair, actually. <laughs> uh, one of, uh, one of uh, my father's brothers was a certain John Gregg, who was a police inspector. He was a police inspector, married to uh, Martha Orr, and uh, John Gregg and Martha Orr had uh, four children, one of whom was uh, Charles Gregor. And Charles Gregor uh, was a legal procurator, but he uh, joined the Times at uh, very early age, about 20. And uh, he was there, you know, rising through the ranks, etc., etc. And I remember when, when I finished school, when I finished my GCEs, etc., I applied for a job uh, advertising the paper. But I had no reply. And then my father had a brainwave. He said, look, your cousin works at the Times. Why don't you ask him? Perhaps he can find you a job there. And I went to speak to Charles, and he suggested I write to Mabel Strickland, Lord Strickland's daughter. And um, I did. And about a month later, she sent for me. She interviewed me at her villa, uh, Villa Parisia, in Lilla. And she told me, well, would you like to start? And I said, next Monday. And I started, this was 1963. And I started at the time since then. And although I, I, I spent the first three years or so trying to look for a different job, I eventually realized that journalism was my career. And I stayed on. <laughs> So it's, it's rather ironic that uh, for a long time um, Charles Greco was the editor of the Daily Times yeah. and you were the editor of the Sunday Times. Exactly. Uh, Not at the same time. Practically at the same time. No, just afterwards. Uh, 
I didn't realize that uh, it would work as it's. <laughs> <laughs> and the biggest story you ever covered? Sorry? The biggest the story, story you ever covered. covered? Or which affected you most? The biggest story you ever covered and which affected you most? I mean, I mean you know, the times have been true. Oh, okay. Uh, Four years ago, <laughs> it's still coming up in university. Four years ago, uh, I remember that time. You know when the when the when the times were set on fire, and I remember telling my wife we had just had a, our second child. It was just a couple of weeks old, and I remember telling my wife, "Let's prepare ourselves to go to Australia because I'm not going to work here anymore." And the times has broken its record. We, the Times always prided itself on never, never failing to miss an issue, not even during the war when the printing press was hit twice. And I said, this time I'm afraid the record is going to be broken because the Times had been burned down and there was nowhere, uh, no way it's going to come out next day. But fortunately, um, it was decided to move to another press, the National Press, and uh, the paper was, came out, just eight pages of it, the next day. And I was called in at midnight to go and write my piece, because I was covering Parliament at the time, and uh, the paper came out just the same. So that, presumably, is the biggest story of my career. Um, there were other, of course, others, but <laughs> that's, that's the highlight. I would say, I don't know whether I should uh, consider it a highlight or uh, the nadir of my experience, but anyway. <coughs> Lost her sight. Lawrence, that was your difficult story. Uh -huh. What was your best scoop? Scoop? <coughs> well, <laughs> I, I always, I also covered uh, for the Italian News Agency. Uh, I covered Malta for an Italian news agency called ANSA, which is the biggest Italian news agency. And I remember, I, I, I can sort of um, claim to having been responsible for the school, because one of our MPs, uh, a Labour MP, I don't know whether I should mention him by name, he was caught in Italy and actually held prisoner held in prison for some time on the charge of carrying uh, illegal goods of contraband. And no one in Malta would break the story. And then I, I got a tip from Ansa and I reported it. And suddenly the secret was out and uh, <laughs> this guy was eventually uh, free, but uh, it was, you know, it was something that the secret was the secret, so everyone was agreed to keep the secret, but suddenly it came up. Uh, it was one thing. And then, of course, there were other stories. Um, for instance, one of my highlights was the uh, Bush Parliament of Summit here. Uh, I was very much involved in that, because um, I was covering also for a German news agency uh, to keep so, so many balls in the air, you know, going at the same time. Uh, there were other stories, I mean, so many, I, I can't recall the, the Egypt Air Hijack, for instance. The Egypt Air Hijack was my baptism of fire with the Italian news agency, because it was a month after I took over uh, from uh, uh, a certain Dr. Manuel Mixi, who used to be the answer correspondent, I took over from him, and I suddenly find myself facing this very big story which unfortunately resulted in the killing of 60 people on board this Egyptian airline. And when you look back, um, how, what differences, if any, do you see? Uh, for example, you mentioned that uh, there was this big scoop which was um, held up by Maltese papers, by the Maltese media. Um, but how, how probable would it have been today that uh, the secret would not have been divulged. I mean, what changes have there been, uh, especially with the impact of social media? Exactly, I mean, social media today is a, 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 a genie out of the bottle, you know, you can't, you can't really control it. 
uh, and uh, nothing is secret anymore. I mean, even even the merest gossip finds itself into social media, and uh, you know, uh, you have fake news, of course, and you have to distinguish between fake news and real news. Uh, this is it. I mean, so that that kind of story wouldn't have lasted very long. I'm, I'm I invite Mr. Joe Bosch, President of the Hajar Museum, to make the conclusion. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thank you, Lorenz. Our heartfelt thanks for you being here this morning, and I suppose to also shared by these people who have uh, come over to hear you address us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to As you know, most of you know, uh, this evening we'll be opening up uh, a very good exhibition um, February and Coachetta <coughs> Exploring Light. You can already see the paintings and the etchings and the lithographs uh, on the uh, ground floor, first floor and second floor. Okay? That's uh, for this evening at 6.30. Obviously, I will always invite you this museum being run by volunteers and uh, the uh, Fundación de Victoria being um, an organization uh, led by volunteers to help us help you present these events. You've got an envelope here who would uh, gratefully accept your donations. Thank you very much. Just a final word about some forthcoming events on the territory of May. At 7.30, there's going to be a talk by Arnold Cassola, also the man the Magnificent, and Malta. And on the following day, uh, there's going to be a big event here with various authors who will be coming here in the morning and will spend the whole morning here. And uh, you can meet them and, uh, and also uh, have a chat with them. Uh, more details will be, will be distributed in the new course. Thank you very much.